furious driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. And they are ready, they're on their marks. Crowds are banging at the doors any moment now. The 2023 NEC Lancaster Classic Motor Show is about to begin. Welcome to Furious Driving and the NEC Classic Motor Show. Let's go look at some cars. We'll start our look around the show with a little bit of time travel because we're here back on setup day when there's a hectic mess of unfinished stands. But you can see I'm perfectly safe as I have a high vis vest of invulnerability. In fact, a child's high vis vest of invulnerability for some reason. And I'm busy uploading video and checking him out on the NEC's public Wi-Fi, so my Mac and all the dark secrets hiding within could be a lot less safe. That's why we need Surfshark, a high-vis vest for our devices, keeping them safe in a dangerous online world. Surfshark is a VPN that's a virtual private network that uses end-to-end -end encryption to conceal your online activity from the networks that are carrying it. That means if someone has hacked into the open public Wi-Fi in a big event space like this, without protection, your personal information, passwords and bank details could all be at risk. But it's not only security, a VPN can create a virtual location all over the planet. And as a lot of the visitors to this show have come from all around the world, and it's great to meet so many of you, thanks for coming, travellers can choose their local server to log into geo-locked sites back home as if they were there, or you can use that access to get better deals from shopping sites in other countries. And it's a gift that keeps on giving as a security suite is included with a search engine antivirus and Surfshark alert that keeps an eye on your personal data for potential security breaches and sends real-time alerts so you can react to protect yourself for identity theft and more. So hit the link in the description and try it for yourself and get an exclusive Surfshark Black Friday deal. It's a promo code FURIOUSSHARK to get up to six additional months for free. Now back to the future. Right, we're going to start a little walk around here in Hall 3A and we are rather lucky to be opposite the Wolseley Register and the Riley Group. Um, some really, really nice cars which all of us have watched arrive and go, ooh, do you know what? I quite fancy one of those. Wow. Morris Oxford Traveller Series 4. Ooh, police one. Police Wolseley. An MO Oxford. From a distance it looks like a big miner, but it's an MO Oxford. Quick glance at the walls of these. We've got ourselves a 690, the big Wolseley. We've got ourselves a 1500, which is a great little thing. They are, these, believe it or not, are one of the most enjoyable, entertaining, laugh a minute cars on the road in terms of classics. And a nine, ah, oh, that's a pretty little thing. As many of you know, I'm really keen to go and get myself a pre-war car. And that's the kind of thing I would really quite like. And these, another one, this is great. This is a, this is a Vanden Plaats, a Wolsey 1300. Mark two, no less. Now, in case you hadn't seen our stand already, this is Steph's Marina, which is uh, about three weeks ago. I had no sills. Frantic welder-a-thon, put the thing back on the road again, repaired the wings because they were falling apart. This is a proper sort of mid 80s, early 90s style home resto kind of thing, which is the kind of stuff we were doing ourselves at home so much, sort of 25 years ago, uh, before a standard got you know, unobtainable almost. Um, this is my 200 VI, which has got here absolutely fine. And then we discovered it had a small problem and turns out the thermostat housing is cracked. So I'm trying to get a thermostat housing here or thermostat here to the show to try and fix over the weekend so I can drive home. And of course, Giselle. We've seen Giselle here at the NEC previously. You can understand why though. It's a lovely classic car, beautiful looking thing. And you would not believe how much stuff you can get inside that car. It's vast. Right, we're now into what I believe is Hall 4. Now, profusion exhausts. I wondered what the cars were over here. You could hear them a long time before you saw them. This is a, if you like, sort of modified 80s, 90s classics. This is the place to come, really. I saw this in the distance. I wanted to have a good look at it. This is, wow, proper early noughties gangster bling, isn't it? Now, the AMG deep dishes, the white leather, white steering wheel. That is, 560 SEC, wow. That's a lot of engine, you could hear it a long way away. And of course the Porsche, you cannot ignore that, can you? Porsche. And this guy, this place, these guys, I've got body panels. I didn't happen to notice when I wandered by yesterday. They have entire sides for minis. I think that's an entire floor pan for a mini. Uh, Magnum car panels, I think. 
I might be getting your details over the weekend. There's mini subframes over there, but I think I've got good ones of them. I'm not sure what this stand is, but I do rather like the slammed Volvo. That's a great colour as well. This is ticking a lot of boxes. And of course the Metro, which is an HLS with the, the lattice wheels, which is so 1980s. 1983 car. <clears throat> and an Austin 7. Oh. I do go dribbly for an Austin 7. Oh, this is one's got a fundraiser on it as well. Good. Have a look at stuff on screen there. Right, so some beautiful commercials here. Morris, Bedford. Well, that's a panel Morris. That's a pickup truck. I love the paintwork on these. Little works of art, aren't they? And we've got ourselves. What's this one? An Austin, Austin A30, A35 van. That's so cool. There's all Ray Herrett and Sons road transport. I love these chunky tires in the back of this thing. It's beautiful. And if you're a bit of a tire nerd, that's a lovely bit of rubber. Oh wow, TR yeah, Drivers Club's got a lot, a lot of cool stuff. Apart from the electric green. Um, TR7 there, convert TR8, sorry, with the Rover V8 powered one. Got a, a shooting brake. So this is actually a 1977 Crayford. So not exactly authorised conversion, but uh, it's got a tracer, I believe. Not entirely unsuccessful. It's actually quite a good looking little thing. It really is very much of its time, but the wedginess and the blockiness kind of work together. I quite like that. We've got ourselves a regular TR7. Uh, again, really cool colours. This is not a 70s colour at all, but I do like the look of that. Oh, that's a Triumph 2000 or 2500? I don't know, actually. Slightly lowered, nice wheels. That really works as a very light resto mod. Again, lovely car to drive. Okay, we have a Ford Group. Ford! Ah! Cozy Sapphire, which in my eyes is the ultimate Cozy. Maybe just because the era I grew up in. That's a great looking thing. Let's have a look underneath it because it's all mirrored up. Wow. That is. <laughs> that's just sparkly, isn't it? And we've got ourselves the Escort Cozy, the whale tail. What year is this one? Is that L plate 93, I guess? Again, super sparkly. Oh, you see how immaculate this thing is. Someone has really gone to town making this thing just perfect. Going back to the era of when I was starting to drive, and these were sort of 10, 15 year old second hand cars. Cheap motoring once. Mark II Escorts were, well, 300 quid. Buy them all day long. Now they're silly money. These ones are about to get mirrors under them as well. I'll leave them to it. Oh, more Triumphs. Triumph 2000, 2500. Again, lowered. Is that lowered? I don't know sure it is actually. It just looks low. And that is a project. A project and a half. A super legera. Adding lightness by the minute. It'd be about a couple of kilos lighter by the time we go home. In which magazine? Practical Classics. A while ago. That is awesome. Plymouth, what model of Plymouth is it? Plymouth Special Deluxe, I'm gonna guess it's about 57, 58 probably. You say these cars, they change the, the panel work, the sheet metal every year, subtle changes. Often the, the main tub, the windscreen, the roof, that kind of stuff, the doors stay the same. They change the grill, front wings, styling details, and without those you can't tell what's what, but that is just so cool. That's going to be on airbags, isn't it? Who knows what's under the bonnet? We'll come back and look at this later on. That's very cool. Wow, Honda VTEC powered Golf. That's exciting. And so I'm not going to call it an easy conversion, but there's plenty of room in there for it. A 
all original apart from the steering wheel inside. That is really cool. And there's BMW. That's very cool, a 520. I'm sure it might not be a 520 anymore. Those BBSs look amazing on it. Scirocco. Club. Oh, this is the Women Drivers Group. This is Katie wrenching wenches little Scirocco, which we see it's in a few shows now, because uh, she does get to a lot of places with this thing, and it is gorgeous. Thanks to Katie for having a look at the, the Rover yesterday on setup day. And this is a rather lovely, I think it's called Arizona, or no, hang on, she did tell me the colour yesterday. I call it salmon pink, she calls it sausage, but it's uh, actually called Alamo. This, uh, this rather interesting colour. I've never seen an MG in this shade before. I guess they sold a few, but everything's in black and white then, so it's hard to tell. This one is a Mercury Comet, I think it's a 62. And I've just read on the screen that this is actually one of five in the UK. I'm actually surprised there are that many, to be honest. I'll try and catch up with the owners later on. Oh, Escort convertible from JKL. Ooh, the early 90s. Oh, the Opal Cadet. That's fun. Yeah, Micros look surprisingly good with a little bit of slammage. Some rally cars. There's a lot of really cool stuff behind the camera, which you're not seeing. I'll cut back to that in a second, because I want to have a quick look at these Supras. That is just stunning. That's just quite amazing, isn't it? A 1981 Mark I Celica Supra. Now you might recall I did review a, a red Celica Supra not so long ago and I absolutely love driving it. That is really, really cool. Stacked headlights. I think it's a slightly different model. We've also got the later versions. Mark IV from the late 90s, the early 90s one as well. See the subtle differences in them. And full on race spec. Ah, now S2000 Club, there's a lot of cool Hondas here. So, S800, S600. Uh, this car, I think I actually know, is a K cars at their finest. Tiny, awesome, cool Honda Matic. Wow, as well, proper city car. This one's a 1972. And this one, wow, that's an interesting little puppy, isn't it? You pull a time machine out of a DeLorean? I don't know if you've been watching legit streetcars restoring his barn find DeLorean, but I'm rather jealous of finding that. Of course, it's got the stainless steel bodywork, the yeah, gullwing doors. Someone did actually send, after junk in the trunk, a novel called Gull, which is like a fictionalised story of the, some people working at the factory. It's actually quite a good story. 300C Owners Club, wow. I didn't know there were enough 300Cs in the UK to start an owners club. This is like a Japanese limo, Granada kind of thing. You can hear that over there. A line of a rally cars being parked. Sounds like you're in Kielder Forest by the sound of that. Killer Kielder. I don't even need to tell you what these are, you know. Driven a couple, absolutely loved. I don't know why I've never got one. I know everyone absolutely adores the Rover 75 on the channel, but this is so much more me. <laughs> oh, it's an RB320. So I drove straight past this. This was a commemoration thing that uh, Subaru did for Richard Burns. It's all done by ProDrive. Uh, it gave loads of extra things. There's a sign here telling all the stuff about it. Special wheels, uh, more power, 320 horsepower, hence the name. Six grand's worth of extras in it. 
I actually had a go at ProDrive when I was working for a newspaper up at ProDrive test tracking one. I was to take photos of it and have a drive. It was huge fun and uh, met Richard Byrne's dad. Shortly after that, I was doing a, an event, a rally thing in France. Our car broke down and I uh, actually got a lift back from Richard Burns' dad in one of those through the Channel Tunnel back into the UK. Fun story. Repatriating the car took a little longer though. Anyway, we've done the Salikas, haven't we? More Salikas, guys, no, oh, Salika Island. Okay, so that's when we're getting a bit of repetition. Nice. Look, check out these. This is a Toyota Enthusiast Club, so they've got a modern, I thought it was a, it's a GR, isn't it? A proper old Land Cruiser. You know, I could kind of see Hippo getting chopped in for something like that, because that is a lot of fun. That's not going to break either, is it? That literally will go on forever. High Lux. God, that's 1998, I think. Our plate, 98, yeah, 99. Hard to believe that's that old. <laughs> you think, what's that doing here? But wait a minute. And this one, I actually had to go and look at the back of it to work out what it was. It's a 1972 Toyota Crown. Styling details in this thing really are quite exceptional. Really cool thing. I, I say there's a lot of its time. Very much the styling details are so much of their time. Toyo, Toyo Glide, which I guess means automatic. It is. And it's got a sunroof. It's got a, a peachy beige sunroof. Wow. Alamo beige. And the auto jumble is setting up over there. So much stuff to root through in a bit later on. Ooh, MR2s. MR2s are brilliant. They've got all three generations here. I do need another Mark 1 at some point. Oh man, 6R4s. I didn't realize there's a 6R4 club. These things are just so cool. Holy moly, someone's made a late model Metro, a Rover Metro. It's a Metro Lynn. I'm not driving a Metro. Oh, wow. Now, I don't know. Uh, a, A14 Lou, is that the original plate? I don't know if this was a later Metro or Rover 100 that's been 6R4ified or a 6R4 that's been Rover Metroified. Hard to say because the doors are the same. I learned to drive in one of those. Morris Minor Owners Club. Uh, mine is a fun. I don't know if it's a, a true comment or not, but apparently Sterling Moss learned to drift in a Morris Minor when he was a young man. I've heard the story a few times, but I'm not sure the dates actually add up. I, I'm rather liking this whole kind of, yeah, bits tacked on and an ammo box on the back rat look thing going on. Oh, Area 51, Guns N' Roses. Okay, one of those things is the correct time period for this. Volkswagen, how dare you? Ah, oh, we've got the wonky engine Mazdas. Okay, this is interesting. Um, not quite sure what it is. It's on the Triumph uh, TR register stand. Uh, so meet the designers. Wayne Scott interviews TR25 designer every afternoon. Okay, so it's TR25. This is a TR2 Speedster. That's pretty cool. It's more regular, if you like, TRs back here. Always good looking cars. TR6. This, of course, is Oh, it's a spat, spatted one. First right-hand drive Triumph TR2 on tour. 1953 car, and then of course the radically different TR8. Another TR8, wow. The year of the TR8. Ah, it's the pre-1940 Triumph Club. Oh, this is cool. A Super 7 Hoyle Coupe from 1928. This is quite interesting because it's got a little two-seater and a little bustle back trunk like incorporated into the bodywork. What a nice looking little thing. And a Triumph Super 7 arrival to the Austin. <clears throat> now we are, it's nine o'clock to the presser now here as well. Technically I'm the presser as well, but because I'm exhibiting, I was here for an hour earlier. 
Ah, M25 Classics, the home of the barn find for sale. I mean, wow. They must have been planting fertilizer on this thing for weeks to get this level of moss on. What is this even? I don't even know. No distinguishing features. It's a rover. Oh, poor rover. This is in worse state than my 200 with this leaky thermostat. That is, <laughs> judging by the state of that bow wheel, the chassis has gone. I mean, look at that. That is just epic crust. I mean, seriously, that's awful. That's BMW's poor 2000. The 2000s, it was a, no, print with 2000, it's a, what well, it is a 2002 Ti? Look at the fur on it. I've never seen such a furry car. Oh, you've got some big stuff over there, big Bentley. Big Datsun Estate, oh that's nice. A 260C, that's a very practical, usable classic, isn't it? Now you might be seeing an awful lot of uh, tarpaulins and things going back across stands, but that's because it's the end of the day. We've done the entire show of Friday on the stands, haven't really seen anything. So let's have a quick look around this hall, which is Hall 5, down the stairs of Joy. Let's see what's lurking around. A motor, they've put on a display here with a couple of uh, Shelby Cobras, very nice. Nice. Shelby Cobra and a XK, which XK is it? I don't even know, 150, longer doors. That is somewhat dwarfed, quite literally, by a bus. A Midland Red, now I don't know a lot about buses, but it does look like a nice looking bus, I have to say. It's a motorway coach, oh, okay. From when the M1 opened in 1959, Midland Red on the ball, put a new fleet of high-speed BMMO CM5T coaches on the road. Well, there you go. It's a BM, whatever I just said. Midland Red Motorway Express. That's a thing I didn't know was a thing, but there you go. Next to it, we've got this cool little Land Rover Ford Control-based um, fire tender. A fire appliance, if you like. That's production number, it's 145th Series 2 forward control from 1960. A lot of, uh, this one's a volunteer fire, fire service, owned this one in Peterborough, but a lot of big companies had these things because they would sort of run around inside factories and huge industrial areas getting to, to put out any blazes that happen to be happening at work. Now this looks like an Austin of some kind. 1930 Austin 12.4 Heavy. Tora Deluxe, basically gumdrop, an Aust which was an Austin Clifton Heavy 12.4, of course. What a superb looking thing. Now, this is the Gatto at their most 1970s. 1974 Zele, or Zeely, possibly. So I'm going to assume it's electric from the plug and lack of exhaust pipe. Looks like it should have sliding doors. I love this swooping groove that goes all the way around and links back up front to back. I'm also curious about the gaffer tape, but I'm sure that's uh, important. Um, let's see what else we've got over here. Oh, this looks exciting. I come back to the bubble cars. Motorbikes, if you're into such things. Sinclair C5s. Now, I do love the fact that those things come with a lockable boot section because you can literally carry the thing away, but yeah, you can lock the boot to stop anyone breaking in, or a large screwdriver would just have that open in two seconds. These are epically cool and so far ahead of their time. Right, what else have we got around here? This is actually where I'm actually quite excited to be. NRSA and two other clubs behind me, which I'm gonna come back to in a second. Hot rods are awesome. I love a hot rod, very much indeed. 32 three window coupe. Um, so that is a traditional proper rod, as you might wanna call it which is the, the traditional standard recipe for building a hot rod. You take a, a 30s Ford, whether it's a Model B, Model A, 32, 34, cut the roof, lose the, uh, the, the bonnet, the hood area, put a bigger engine in it. It's got a Chevy small block, obviously, triple carbs. That is gonna be absolutely fun and maybe a bit terrifying. This one is the latest kind of standard thing to do. This is a 41 Willys Coupe and the Gasser style. Proper drag racing spec thing. And finally, 
That's what you call a business coupe, where the, the guy could sleep in the car when he was working on the road. This is a bit American graffiti, a bit happy days. 37 Ford cab, and these 40, late 30s into 40 Ford, these lovely teardrop headlights, are really pretty. These are a great looking car, standard or modified. The smell of the leather from this one is just out of this world. So there's the NRSA, the National Street Rod Association. Behind them we've got more NRSA. This is more of a, a Brit rod, if you like. There's a Ford Pop, which has been lowered. I'm gonna guess there's a V8, possibly a blown V8 in there. Roof has been chopped, everything good. And finally, what have we got here? This is another Ford. This is 50 something. My knowledge of 50s Fords is escaping me. I'll come back to me later on. I'm gonna run back over here. This is a really fun club, believe it or not. This is the Hearse Club. Um, so we've got a caddy here. Big American style with the, uh, the full vinyl roof, the Landau style with these things here. And all the, the ruched curtains inside, very, very sort of late 60s, early 70s styling going on. Enormous vehicle. Even got the, the sort of coach light on the side. This is what was going on slightly later in the UK. We've got the Granadas, Mark 1, Mark 2 Granadas. This is like the British take on, on the hearse. Same idea, but we've got just a straight vinyl roof covering where they've extended it. And we've got the flower thing on the top. And the Hearst Club are really fun people. One quite amusing thing is they, people say it's really morbid to use these and people even camp in them because it's, it's the perfect shape for lying down, obviously. But, you know, no one's ever died in a hearse. Buy an ambulance and convert it to a camper. Think of all the trauma that's happened in that. This has just only ever been peaceful. And it's a great service history as well. And we've got the Walsley as well, going back a bit older. Nice, uh, we lead work on there. Now, Beyond the hearses, we have got the police cars. Yeah, the police forces in Britain always use pretty hot cars what was on the market at the time. So we've got the Cortina twin cam moving into the uh, 2500TC Triumph and the Rover 3500 or 3005S, the manual V8. And bang up to date with the 850T5. These are some of the fastest, best handling cars on the market at any given time. And often these are real sleeper cars because they're the, the big sort of dad family cars, but the ones that are really hotted up. And it's interesting seeing how the technology of the police equipment has changed over time. So the basic blue light on here, probably a bell under there. This one has actually got a horn on the front, a tannoy, so it's like a speaker for shouting at people. You know, we've got things like the twin mirrors though, so you can always tell. That does look really good, doesn't it? The P6, the SD1s look really good as a jam sandwich as well. Let's run over here and see what else we can find. Because over here we have, ooh, Panard. Check out that, there's a nice Jag, nice MG. But yeah, one of these got bangered a little while ago. I'm not sure how much original Panard was actually left in it by the time it went around the track. Really, really interesting interior and everything, frankly, on these cars. Fabulous and amazing. Now, Simca's Matras. Simca 1501 Special Estate. Ooh, that's pretty. Lovely. This has got a really clever tailgate arrangement where the floor is a table to lift out for picnicking. A Mirena, wow, cool. Three-seater arrangement, like in a uh, McLaren F1. So a three-seater car, not many of those around. Another Simca 1500, crikey. I didn't even notice that. You'd, you never see two of them in the same place, do you? Wow. And over here, a Simca 1100. Slightly awkward looking car, funny really, but kind of similar idea with the bustle back from the um, Renault Megane in later years. Ah, moving quickly forward, more tall but blimey, two more Mirainas. Wow, check out that button down velour, that's amazing. Oh, hello. Hello Citroëns, Traction Avance. Obviously we featured a Traction Avance on the channel not so long ago. Fabulous things, really, really nice drive. I'll grab onto the uh, 2 CV. 75 years of the 2 CV. Crikey, we'll jump onto that in a moment. And the Ami Club. Oh, and an SM. SM's a delightful, that lovely Maserati engine in there. Oh, is this the, S, the uh, Ami you actually drove on the channel recently? Do I think it might be? I'm just going to check the uh, number plate. But I think we've actually driven that actual car.
Oh, a Saxo. Wow, modern classic. Y plate, so 2001, same age as my Mini. It even takes me by surprise sometimes when I see a Y plate and it's being a classic. But it is genuine near classic and a great little hot hatch. Oh, finally a DS, which I'm hoping has got better <laughs> underpinnings and less mastic than poor old Kitsch on up and down vids discovered in his recently. Oh, and finally, we've got a rare Citroen H van. Rare because it's not got anyone selling coffee out of it at the moment. Oh, uh, Corvette. Doesn't that look Ferrari-esque these days? Wow, look at all the fit of the Polsky Fiat Club. They are some great cars, because obviously the little, little Fiat was built for a long time over there. In fact, it was always built over there. And the, the uh, Pol Polish club for it is huge support. Right. Everything under covers, Mustangs, Mini Mustangs, uh, Rover 75 MG and ZT Club. So yeah, we've got some really cool stuff here. So first off, two and a half litre in this astonishing primrose yellow, co yellow colour. Isn't that stunning? And he touched an early one because he got the uh, little lozenge torpedo badges on the door. Mark it out as an early car and also black sills. So a uh, Cowley built car. First ones are built where the Mini is now built, before everything was shipped off to, uh, to Longbridge after BMW divested themselves of Rover. And this is interesting. This is, I believe, the custom-built one um, with the folding hard top, I think, from a Mercedes. Oh, it was an E-Class, yes. Mercedes E-Class roof, which someone did convert at home. When I say at home, this is a piece of <laughs> beautiful, elegant engineering. It's a stunning job. The guy's done a, a coupe as well, which I think were based on concept art from Rover. So, uh, yeah, so sort of a certain amount of legitimacy to it, and it is absolutely stunning. If anyone's interested, by the way, my uh, 75 is currently on Car and Classic, and uh, I don't want to part with it, but I do need it gone. Um, maybe I'll put a link in the description. Oh, and an MG ZT. What is this one? A 180, so it's a two and a half litre V6 in a fantastic metallic aubergine colour. Fantastic. Oh, we've got the um, Modern Executive Club. So they've got a couple of interesting cars. They've got the big Jag 2007 XJ 4.2 Sovereign, the X350, which is all aluminium, beautiful car. And this is interesting. This is actually genuinely quite... Again, another, wow, that's old enough to be a classic now. A 2002 XC90. Who would have thought it? That's just stunning. Big old thing though, you kind of forget that. Oh, we're back with more Rovers, hooray! We've got the Coupe Club. A rather lovely nightmare red. Standard wheels. Ooh, nice silver stone inside. I'm walking quickly now because my battery's going down really fast. So, <laughs> this beautiful uh, charcoal grey one actually followed me in to the show itself. Nice tan leather interior. Oh, that's beauty. Beautiful. I think this one's actually a turbo as well. And this one is Tahiti blue, as mine should look. In fact, eventually I'll get mine painted and it will look this good again. Lovely. SD1s, oh god, aren't oh, SD1s nice? This is another thing, there's so many really, really, really cool, lovely cars that I just wish I had a much bigger barn to put in, because SD1s are the natural progression from the P6. Wouldn't get rid of the P6, obviously, but you know, these things are just great. I've driven a couple of them and they are awesome. And again, the BRM, this is basically my car with a better gearbox and more bling. And I kind of feel like, yeah, on the one hand, I would quite like a BRM because everyone knows them, they're kind of cool, but mine's got the exclusivity. No one knows what mine is. But these do look very, very cool indeed, and I've got these wheels on my coupe. I wonder if that uh, exhaust tailpipe's for sale, because I've got a really naff exhaust on my 200. <laughs> I'll come back and make an offer. But yeah, the difference here is, of course, that these have got this fabulous quilted red leather seats, red steering wheel, red quilted uh, centre console, gear knob, door cards, all this stuff. And of course the silver bits and the BRM stuff. Yeah, you know what we're talking about here. Right, more Rovers, let's run around in a circle in this direction. We've got P5 Club, they've got a pair of cars. This would be a, a six cylinder with the, uh, a th yeah, three litre with the two headlights and a V8 with the four headlights. This one's a coupe, which always confuses people because it's got four doors, but it's actually called a coupe, so I'm not getting it wrong. <clears throat> now here we've got the P6 Club. 
Bob. So hang on, which one are we in? Yeah, P6 News, that is the, the P6 Rover Owners Club. So we've got a V8, which has got some interesting additional vintage going on here. So I wonder what is happening under the bonnet, whether he had cooling issues or he's got something a bit more. Oh, it's a 1973 Australian Export. Ah, okay. Explaining, I've never seen those fences before. I've seen the Nard American fence. I've never seen those. So that's interesting. Or oh, a pair of Luna Grey Series 1, 1963. Oh, these are the FLKs. Look at the number plates. 145 FLK, 149 FLK. These were the pre-production prototypes um, that were given out to the press in the early days. These are basically the oldest surviving P6s. And finally, we've got a 35S with... Uh, that's the Narda bonnet. I'll take you over here and show you this. This is the more common American scoopy bonnet with the big three nostrils for the California heat. Lovely colour, mums are red. And all de novo wheels as well. This car's got all the toys. And it's a manual, being an S. Quickly divert over here because we've got the mini clubs. I didn't bring my mini, obviously. But yeah, this is all the mini registers now. The modern mini registers. So we've got the um, O2S register for the, uh, the supercharged ones. The Y register for the, well, like what I've got, the pre-production original R50s from 2001. And there's a convertible register over there as well. Oh, people kept on telling me about the Crown Vicks. Oh, that's, that's my perfect Crown Vic just there. Black car, nudge bar, Appletons, oh, fantastic. Oh, the Blues Mobile as well. There's so much to see here. This battery's me dead in two minutes. <laughs> Got this perp on the bonnet. Oh, we saw this car last time with the really unusual police stop thing. Where was this one from? This is uh, Michigan. That's unique to them. It's a real throwback. A huge gumball light on the top. Dodge Monaco, should be a 74 Dodge Monaco. Don't know if this is the same one that we did in the video a little while ago. I'm not sure actually. It's hard to tell because they all look exactly the same and they all have the prop number plates so you can't tell them apart. Nicely faded lettering and everything, the P1, the star sprayed out, serve and protect dulled out. They even got Elwood's uh, briefcase handcuffed to the bull bar on the front. Oh, wow, an Edsel. One of the greatest flops in motoring history. Curious looking car, but honestly, I don't mind it. It's quite a cool thing. That, that vertical grille is quite fun. And you get these 50s interiors are just absolutely gorgeous. Now, what else we got over here? Minis. A John Cooper, a Rover Cooper, John Cooper S. It's an early one of those. Seven grand at new plus 1751 for the Cooper bit. Mark III Mini, 1970. Cooper SR, 1950, sorry, 2001 R53. And this is a Mark II, yay, Mark II. Sliding windows, not, not the wheels on that. Nice interior on this one as well, I love the green. So look at all the different bits. Downton sticker, that's got nice heads on it. So much to see and do. What's this one? A uh, not a factory? Is it? Oh, it's a mini Rover Cabaret? It is a factory. Wow. Okay. The Cooper Works ones often get a lot of extra little bits and pieces and tweaks and things, making them a little bit more exciting. Oh, this is fun. Wrong way round. Adventure Mini. So you don't need a big, massive 4x4 to go off-road. A Mini will do everything you need. Uh, I've wandered away from the Rovers I was looking at. We've gone into the Borg Wards, wow. Borg Ward is a Bella. Wow. Isabella Combi. These are super rare. Pretty, pretty cars. I don't know enough about these as I ought to, but they are rather lovely. And this is something I didn't know even existed, a Borg Ward Alexander. This is so, well, this show is just so incredible because your eyes are opened constantly. It looks like a tiny Volvo P544. <laughs> I love these little on the top indicator lamps. Oh, the two tone on this one's fabulous. Oh, back to the Rovers again. Crikey. This is the 600 and 800 Club. 600 is like the forgotten Rover. People go, oh yeah, they made one of those. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> and here we have the 800, which I've not forgotten, but are sadly undervalued for the incredible machines that they are. We've got a pair of for the fastback in England, they call it the fastback, and a and a coupe. Which normally, often came with the uh, Honda V6s, and a very nice interior. Now, familiar territory here: the 200 and 400 Club. Obviously, 
I have a number of these things. Now, first of all, the Streetwise. Wasn't this thing so radically ahead of its time? Because at the, when it came out, people just mocked it for being a front-wheel drive hatchback with jacked up suspension and stuck on plastic bits and pretend, you know, off-roady stuff. And now this is all anyone wants to buy. So 20 years ahead of their time, honestly. Rover, brilliant as always. Here we've got the SD3 um, 200, which, you know, left-hand drive as well. And uh, that Portuguese plate on it. This is the, uh, the, the first Honda collaboration, isn't it? And uh, yeah, kind of boxy. Didn't have the same good looks as the later ones, but it was a great entry into the world of the Honda, the Rondas, if you like. And this is a Vitesse with all the toys and the nice wheels. And if ever you say you've got Rover 200 and people make the uh, Mrs. Bouquet references, this is what they're talking about. And finally, there's a Tourer with actual paint. I've seen this one a couple of times before. It's quite well known with the wheels and the lows and the, the nice wooden steering wheel. It's actually quite a cool looking car. Yeah, I'm not saying it's given me any influence ideas for mine, but mine might well have a few little tweaks when it comes back from the paint shop and I get my hands on it again. Now here in Hall 3, Burton always put on a display of some decent sporting Fords. Here we've got a couple of Escorts and very different generations, but epic liveries, of course. Over here, Wolseley Owners Club. You always forget how much badge engineering went on with Wolseley. There's, uh, there's got the Hornet. 680, obviously sharing their identity with other brands within the, the range. But this is interesting. This is something that very few people would know about. Now, coming out of World War II, it was clear that the British Army needed some kind of Jeep equivalent, and so obviously the Land Rover happened in the end of the 40s, but Nuffield was also doing something similar. And this is called the Gutty, I think they called it, um, a prototype 115 that were built and uh, Wolseley got the chance to do it. Lord Nuffield sort of okayed the thing. I've never seen one before. But these prototypes were then given over to Austin to produce as the Champ, which is a slightly better known version of the all-wheel drive off-road Austin. But yeah, I wasn't even aware that there was a, a Wolseley version of these things. And of course, there's a little tribute to Harris Mann, who sadly we lost this year. Better known, but very beautiful, are the Riley RMs various generations. These are very sleek and elegant cars from all the uh, different decades they were built. 45 to 57 the sign over there says. I like these early ones with the uh, vinyl roof and the suicide front doors. A lovely, lovely grill. This one even has the benefit of a little uh, hood ornament. I do love a bonnet mascot. And alongside them we have a 1956 Riley Pathfinder. More badge engineering from within the group. Now these, very quickly, are superb Austin Woodies. The Austin County's Car Club have brought along some absolutely spectacular station wagons and this display is fabulous. The theme of the year is uh, perfect partners and this is a perfect partner to any day out. These things are just lovely aren't they? Oh I love the Austin toweling as well. This is an A70 Hereford Country Woody, Countryman Woody. So, as you can see in the photo, the standard chassis and front end metalwork and then hand-built woodwork. This must have been so labour intensive and time consuming to build. Christmas ready? There are 12 days of Christmas. None of them are in November. <laughs> Gosh, these things are just beautiful. I am rather tempted to own one of these things. But I'm sure I would very soon be dealing not only with rust, but with woodworm as well, dry rot. No, my luck. I'm going to linger on these a second longer because they are just absolutely lovely. What are the other models we have here? No, an A70 Hampshire. And finally, an A16 Countryman. The Hereford might be my favourite here, if I'm going to pick a favourite. But that's hard to pick because they're all rather lovely. This is perhaps the most maligned corner of the halls, the Maxis and the Allegros. Actually very good cars, despite the um, anti-BL bashing that goes on. Surprisingly advanced, very good to drive. And the Allegros, of course, hamstrung by the fact that they had to use the heater box out of a different car, the Marina, I think it was, that was way too big for the design. Harris Mann designed a beautiful, futuristic, wedgy car and it got turned into something a little bit different, but they've picked up some great looking examples. The perfect beige early one. Do you have a Quartic in this one? 
Yes, we do have a Quartic steering wheel, yes. And this is kind of my favourite of them, it's the, the estate, because it's the most gawky looking thing. In beige, absolutely spectacular. And this, 1750s, an HLE or something. Oh, it's also, also Quartic. That's an SS, wow. So that is as good as it gets in Allegro land. Superb colour as well. So this is the GCCG, the Gay Classic Car Club. They always have a spectacular arrangement of cars. Now, I'm going to start off with this one because I grew up as a child riding around in the back of one of these. A Carmen Gear Type 34 Razor Edge. When uh, Volkswagen decided the original Carmen Gear was looking a little too cute and a bit too old fashioned, they wanted something very, very futuristic and exciting and new to sort of carry the platform and the idea forward. And so they brought out this thing. It is just all sharp edges and creases and just absolutely stunning. Remains rear engined, but a bigger back seat. You've got a load area in the front and the back, so it's actually a very practical family car. This one's a 1500S. So many cool angles in this. That's next to another actually very cool car, a Vauxhall Tigra. And these were a bit of a splash when they came out, first of all end of the 90s these appeared as if from nowhere and they look so cool with the uh, big glass back end and everything they were very very cool looking cars drove nicely as well and this is another exciting little car Amazon Estate obviously we saw a few of these in Gothenburg a few weeks ago months ago even now Bug. Oh, hello. Not much overshadows a Bond bug. I'm shouting over the announcement about the minute silence. Someone's brought along a DS Decapitable. These were taken from Citroen and built by jean ri Chevron. Perfect French pronunciation there, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, these are astonishingly rare and valuable. I love how they've put the indicators that were up on the roof down here on the side. Very, very nice car indeed. Oh, what's that on the a radio over there on the left? That's an interesting fitment, which looks from the surround like it's original. A gear shifter on the top, that's interesting. Everything on this car is interesting, even the peach and green interior. Wow. Uh, spinning around here, we've got ourselves a Mini, very much race prepared, Austin Cooper. A Mark I or a Mark II? Excellent, love that. And we've got a couple of 90s curios. We've got a 93 Mark III Astra in stunning condition. Oh, this is the one that won the Festival of the Unexceptional in 2022. And then suddenly there's a whole plethora of people buying Mark III Astras. And that's next to a Honda Aerodeck. I mean, these are, I don't know, I don't think they're astonishingly rare or no one drives them anymore. They just hide them in garages. It ticks every box of a very very cool 90s car pop-up headlights cam towel rear end wedge rising belt line velour oh it's an automatic sorry owner that's so cool right let's move away from that stuff because there's other stuff to look at now, let's jump over to the austin club because austin sevens and you know i'm just going to go and look at austin sevens a bit because i like them and sixes it's strange how the six is bigger than the seven well i was six scared of seven because he was done for GBH. Oh, so many different possibilities with an Austin 7. You've got your chassis and you've got your front bulkhead bit and bonnet area. And the, beyond that, it could be almost anything. So we've got a three door, sorry, two door fixed hard top. We've got ourselves a little two door removable convertible thing. We've got another sliding hard top with a slightly different back end on it the later one and this one is a speedy type 75 this is car body number three the first car to deliver to the public wow that's cool but these are just the value on these little open top hotel ones is just astronomical compared with the rest of the uh, the saloon cars they're so pretty okay much metropolitans Ah, little bathtubs on wheels. And someone's racing this one. That's astonishingly brave. Oh, my goodness me. This one 
is a tad interesting. So we've got the blower sticking through the bonnet. Lowered and we're on very wide tyres. We've basically got a dragster, haven't we? This is a drag racing thing. Sarah Godfrey, whoever you are, we salute you. Oh, check out this build list. DB4 Zagato door handles. That is awesome. I approve wholeheartedly. Uh, somewhere around here, I will find the MG ZT. I did a film on very recently comparing it to my M75. Oh, now if you ever wondered what an MG SV stand like, now have a chance to find out. The answer is it sounds very nice. So here we have the MG Club, so you've got the two generations of the TF, the F. A racing prepared F. Ah, I've got the later, it's an MG6. You really don't see many of those around, do you? MG6 Magnet. And this is Batch's MG ZT that we drove on the channel literally a month ago, I think. And a ZS and a ZR. Excellent. Ooh, there's an 8 Series over there as well. So much good stuff. Good times all round. Are we into the auctions now? OK. But I think I want to focus more on the clubs and this stuff. Ooh, Aston Martin. Ooh, W123. Only 25,000 miles. 24 grand, wow. What spec is it? It's a one. And it's a manual, oh my word. It's a base 200, but lovely, lovely condition. Now I feel like I'm coming home. We've got Land Rovers. The Land Rovers are plenty. So we've got a military Wolf Land Rover, I assume this is. Fitted for radio, radio FFR 24 volt. And very nicely restored as well. Ah. And this is a, I guess, a Desert Storm or something, era 110. Military number plate's quite hard to tell. This is the ex Military Land Rover Association, if you hadn't already guessed. Now, this one is quite unusual. It's a 101 Ford Control hearse. And if you're a Land Rover fan all your life, what a better way to take your last ride than a 101. That's actually quite incredible, isn't it? Other Land Rovers we have lurking around here, got the Range Rover group. I actually have to stand slightly further back with these ones because they're quite big. We've got a classic original shape, but quite a late one. Got itself a P38, which is the kind of car that donated its engine an earlier Vogue, which I guess is about, what, 1990 or so? It's F-plate, yeah, 89. Good guess. These have got 3.9 in them. They sound so, so good. And, of course, the bull bar. This was the essential accessory in the, uh, in the 1990s. Now it's very much frowned upon. But they do look so good on these. It's worth it for the aesthetic. <laughs> Series 1 Land Rover Club is this. Series 1 and 2s. So, so cute. There's like a off-road prepared one with the chunkier wheels and tyres and things. This is very much true to the original style. Lots of restoration goes on to these. I think these, these cars need to be used. This is, this is beautiful I and mean, I would absolutely love to own this, but honestly, a Series 1 or 2 of any Land Rover, it needs to be out. Just bumping over things, going into the woods. You can see how basic it is. It's got the, um, the wipers individually switched on the bulkhead itself. Nothing in terms of protection from the elements or anything else, frankly. That's kind of how you expect a, a serious Land Rover to look. Covered in stuff, battered paint, looking loved and used, as does this one. This is kind of the perfect in-between place, maybe. And behind us, we've got another Land Rover club. There's quite a lot of Land Rover clubs, all in one place. This is quite cool. Uh, series 2 club. It's a larger than the original Series 1, obviously. This is little... Recovery Land Rover. So this thing apparently was bought by a recovery company who recovered it after accident and it worked for many years on the Foss Way recovering stuff and even later on taking engines in and out of narrow boats. So interesting truck. More farm spec tilted up Series 2s. Oh, it's a tipper body one. That's oh, just really cool. You see it's still working for all the mud on it, which is excellent. But these things do, they go on forever and ever and ever. They are just brilliant. 
Land Rover Ambulance. I'm not sure what stand this is, but we've got a pair of twin engine minis with mini engines. Twin carb in the boot, a four carb mini. Imagine balancing that lot. I don't know who put them here, but I like them. Uh, Classics World, this is uh, Classics Monthly and other magazines. Got a nice Range Rover, oh, it's a Jeep L plate, 93, very, very late. So this is the CVC Club. I always look to, like to look at their collection. They're all ex Land Rover vehicles, ex press cars, ex um, development vehicles, that kind of thing. So a G4 coloured L, um, L322, a P38. We've got one of the very, very first Range Rover Sports a supercharged one. This is that lovely orange colour they did for very early sort of noughties first editions of the Freelander, the Range Rover Sport, that kind of stuff. The Evoke, I think, as well. And this is a Freelander Mark II, Mark II Sport. A V6 three-door from 2004, press car, for when they facelifted it. So the magazines and newspapers would have borrowed it. Top Gear, that kind of thing, would have driven it. I do still prefer the pre-facelift. But it's only Freelander I've seen in there, so maybe I should have brought a Pippo. And these, Project J. These are interesting ones. Now, I was talking to the owner about this yesterday. This is preservation for the early f discoveries. That's a TDI, now that's TDI with a lovely, the, the mountainy graphics, so late 80s, it's fabulous. Now one of these, I think it's this one, is quite unusual because it's got a Rover T series in it, which is a thing they tried for sort of tax reasons to put a smaller engine in the car, and it sold particularly well in, in Italy and places like that, and there's sort of a few in this country as well. But yeah, to two litre T series from a Rover car, check how narrow and lovely those tyres are. That's so cool. But yeah, I wasn't aware any existed at all. Oh, hello, Talbots. I only ever see these things here at this show. Look at the other classics I do see sort of running around places. I never see one of these out on the road. This is the Beast, which actually photographed for its recent sale. Uh, video, in fact, for Car and Classic which is built by John Dodd back in the 70s. He basically had to leave the country because Rolls-Royce got hounding him for a copyright infringement for sticking this Rolls-Royce grill in the front of this 27 litre. It's not a Merlin, I think it's a Griffin engine actually, but it's basically a tank slash aircraft engine. It's unbelievably quiet, but it's sold at auction. I'm not quite sure what it made. It made quite a lot of money, but not as much as I thought it would, being such a unique thing. There's some incredible stories about this thing when it was uh, being driven by Mr. Dodd himself, but it was that, uh, unique kind of sandy beige custard colour before, just been repainted and also re-trimmed as well. Um, it does look a bit more dignified and stately, but I think I kind of actually preferred the, the weird yellow because, well, it suited the weirdness of the entire car. Now I've seen two other things I want to go and take a quick look at. First of all, we've got this Expedition Safari spec. Is that Pontiac? I think it might be. No, it's a Chevrolet, sorry. Late 40s Chevy, probably looking at air. I can't even read that. Martel Deluxe, maybe? That looks like it's a lot of extra little gauge work in there. So all the switches and things for timing gear and what have you for competition. So, pretty serious bit of kit. Now, that was one thing. Someone's only gone and smuggled in an Auburn Speedster in their suitcase. Supercharged 1930s Art Deco loveliness. I mean, just, just drink it in. That is such an epic, rare, wonderful sight. You don't often get to see these things, so when you do, just take a moment. This was the pinnacle of 1930s engineering and styling. Now, I don't know if this is an original one or not, because there, I think there are actually more fakes than originals, but it has got the Auburn serial tags on it, so probably is real. Wow in the presence of greatness. Now the company was related to the Cord company, which did the fabulous Cord 810 and 812, similar period. And those were the most expensive cars, most advanced cars. The difference was this was, although sharing a lot of similar Art Deco styling, this is far more traditional in that it's not front wheel drive, it's not hydro pneumatic. Uh, Selector's got a manual gearbox and rear wheel drive. Fixed headlights. And generally, more traditionally engineered, but equally exotic looking with these massive exhaust pipes out the side. Now, here we have a store we cannot walk past. This is the Lancia's. 
The uh, Delta is on my all-time dream list of cars. I absolutely adore them. The later the Evo, the better, as far as my little tick box goes. An 037 rally car, which is oh, just incredible, like a Stratos on steroids. A little app here. Aren't they just pretty? So that's a little lovely little Zagato nicely. Zagato always these terribly delicate, fragile covers on the front, which seems so beautiful. Better to look in an art gallery than on the road, perhaps. A full Via Berliner. A bit like a Alpha Julia from the 70s, in a way. And this, of course, an Aurelia. One of the prettiest cars ever. And that's a top 10 list of most beautiful things ever to sit on four wheels. Uh, Beta is a stunningly rare because of the steel issues that made them dissolve. And a Beta Spider, so likewise. And a Beta Berliner, Natch. Cool. Very, very cool indeed. Now, let's run over here quickly. We're running out of time before the show opens. This is the problem with having a stand here. You have to be on the stand for like 19 hours during the daytime and you get to see it when it's shut. Daimlers, Daimlers and Lanchesters. Of course that is, oh, we stopped going on. Please remove the vehicles to the next Thank you. Oh, this is the cool thing. I was obsessed with these when I was a kid. Daimler Dingoes, which is a little scout car from the Second World War. That sort of looks so interesting and fun. I love how the driver sits at a weird angle so you can just fit in there because there's no other room. Engine sort of slung out here in the back. What an amazing thing. And of course, all bulletproof, so you're looking through a little tiny slot. Unless, of course, you're being shot at and then you're looking through an even tinier slot. 1944, this one is. Only, only built from 1939 to 1945. I thought they built them into the 50s, I guess. 1934 Daimler 15 light saloon. Will you stop going on? Right, more Italian specialness. We've got the Alfa Romeo Club over here, Alfa Club UK, or Club Alfa UK if you will. Alfa 6. I said there are two Alfa 6s in this building, which represents about 110% of all the Alfa 6s around. Nuvola Blue on a 166. This is just lovely. 75, so, so good. <laughs> Transaction B6 amazingness. 2600 Spider. Oh man alive. And a sad. What an epic thing to drive. So well balanced, so perfectly balanced. And of course, last but by no means least, we have of course got another six. How on earth do they find two sixes on the road driving at the same time to get here? That's amazing. Well done, Club Alpha. And the X19 Club have popped up with selection of these fabulous little, well basically MR2 inspirations aren't they? Mid engine, rear wheel drive, delicate handling, lightweight, sharp style, what's not to love. Likewise, the coupes, this is well up on my list of cars to actually own one day, it's quite a long list to be fair. Um, but yeah, this is the same platform, the uh, Tipo platform with my 145, so I could change one just pretend I've lost a rear door, that's all it is, I've got the same car just with this practicality, but look at the styling of the thing. We drove a black one 20 valve non turbo recently. And I did rather like it, I have to say. We've got an amazing body coloured stripe across the dashboard. It kind of works best on the brass coloured cars, it's a nice contrast to the black coloured cars. They don't really blend in a bit, one can say. And into Fiat Motor Club GB, which technically I think I'm a member of actually. I'm a big fan of Punto. It's an HGT, I think it is. Oh, look at that stunning yellow. It's a deep flight for my little 1.2, but actually fast and able to handle. And here we've got Joe Miller from Miller Corner and our magazine stuff. So it's a Cento, which has got quite a few little modifications on it. Check out Miller Corner if you want. You'll find out information about the car. Fun little car, but it's used every day and lives outside. So not quite as yellow as the yellow car next to it. Now here we've got a 1972 127. Can you believe they've been around that long? Incredible. One of the most prolifically built cars of all history, because obviously it got taken over by the Russians who continue to build it for many years afterwards. Pandas, pandas are surprisingly old car <coughs> now. 40 odd years old. 
so many varieties of panda. Four by four, of course, is the best one. And we've got our multiple, first multiple. A cute little multiple, a little moustache. Looking cool and fun with funny doors, suicide -y doors, and big doors in the back. And one dial. And then, of course, the multiple, which I actually have a secret anchoring for because, well, why wouldn't you? It's so ugly, it's brilliant. The big multiple, so much space, such a small footprint, it's a genius bit of packaging. And finally, because they've simply been missing out on their theatre idea this season, <laughs> that's a severe oversight, got a little strata. Built by robots, as they say, or, or built by robots, if you remember the uh, Smith & Jones thing. We've got auto yachts as my local Fiat dealer back in the day. <laughs> so the actual slogan was for Fiat and Lancia. The answer is auto yachts, and they sung it very jauntily. I'm not going to do that. But the auction over this side does have a few little interesting things. We've got ourselves an Alpha Zagato SZ, which is astonishingly rare. I uh, kick myself constantly for not buying one I was offered for £19,000 a couple of years ago. A DeLorean for sale which is also extremely cool. And we've got an MG SV. So yeah, I'm not, I've seen more MG SVs in this one building today than I have in the last 10 years. Oh, and there's a very, very nice Alpha GTA over there as well. And a Bond replica, I seem to replica, a real movie car, Aston Martin. Wow, oh, very nice Mercedes over there. Oh gosh, so much cool stuff. But, so I'm running away currently from the Rover Village, the Rover 200, 400, Club, lovely, lovely people who came through in an emergency and found for me a thermostat for my 200 VI, which broke its thermostat on Thursday night. And this means we can now find some spanners and a helpful mechanic and get this thing fitted later today and I can drive my car home rather than being trailered, which would be an absolute nightmare from here. Right, back to the stand. Ooh, lovely classic American stuff. Big caddy, so I'm running, so I should be on the stand right now. Check this thing out. This is a uh, Kaiser Darren. I mean, wow, literally wow. Crikey. Oh, Cadillac Eldorado. Shot this for Classic American very recently, actually. So, running through the hall, we just running to this man here. This is Ian Pop Bang Color. Hi, Cook. Yeah. Hello, you've seen him in a video a while ago talking to him about his life and his art and other stuff. And, and then, other things. and I saw, he saw me in a video painting Hippo. Ta-da! We've now got that painting to take home and stick in a frame on the wall next to the picture of my Rover 2000. He did it a while ago during lockdown. Thanks for you. Thank you. Pleasure, Pleasure sir. Indeed. Pleasure doing business with you, always, sir. Always, always. Hey, good show so far? Uh, yes. 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 If you're, if you're in the halls, come and find Ian. He's got amazing pictures of so many cars on some rather lovely mugs. But don't buy these mugs because mine are nicer. But he's got some lovely stickers as well. You can buy them. <laughs> Rude! <laughs> <laughs> now, while the show is in full swing, Tinkering is still happening. This is live action tinkering. This is a Rover K-Series thermostat, which you'll notice is not in the engine of a Rover K-Series. It's on the floor here on the stand. Fortunately, or unfortunately, it was noticed that when we pulled into the show, there was gushing fluid pouring out the bottom of the car. And that meant, well, we had a bit of a look, wrenching wench, if you look at her on Twitter, or X, whatever the hell we call it, um, and it was hand passing by with some tools, and we had a look, and we discovered that the thermostat was cracked. That led to a pretty serious panic. <laughs> Fortunately, after shouting to all the usual suspects who I know in the Rover community, the wonderful people in the Rover 200 and 400 Club, who I cannot thank enough, uh, found a second-hand good used OEM one and were able to bring it in the next day. So, on the passenger seat of the car right now, next to some rather lovely art, we now have a thermostat. So I can actually drive home without losing all of my coolant. Fortunately, the good luck continues. Lovely Matt over there is helping out on the stand today. He was also quite a handy tinkerer because I'm talking to you lovely people when <laughs> on, on the stand and it means I'm not free to tinker. So tinkering Matt is tinkering away. Thank you, tinkering Matt. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm ogling this beautiful Riley Pathfinder. Matt is back under the bonnet again. <laughs> not my rover, he says. <laughs> Matt is busy, we've now got the old thermostat off, new one's waiting to get back on with new O-rings in it, and hopefully the car will be drivable again very soon. I'm going to go back to the stand again and stop filming him. This is the way I like to do work though, this is the best way to do work. We are here flying through the halls to catch the... Final uh, day! Final, day. final day. day! Someone's very ready for the, uh, the auto jumble apparently. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, got, to, got to come prepared for these things. Yeah, so now we're desperately trying to film things we haven't filmed and trying to remember what we've filmed. And I, know, yeah, I was editing last night thinking, did I see that? Or, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's... A, if you're new to the show, it's important to remember and stress just how enormous this place is. Yeah, we've we got a long walk. Is it six, six entire halls of this place? Yeah. And yeah, we are tucked away in Hall 3A, quite a good little spot, but there's so much more. And so much more. because we want to be able to see you if you're coming to the show, we are very much tied to the stand. Yep. And so our entire time of looking at the show is this hour. Now is this hour. Oh, that's it. Oh, hello. Oh, that's a classic motorhome. Ah, OK. I drove that car many, many years ago. Oh, really? <laughs> now, this will excite you, being an ex-discovery owner. The J Project group over there. Oh, yeah. One of the owners of that has got one of the two-litre T-Series powered oh, no, defenders. An MPI. An MPI. Not in the show, but in the car Miserable park. Petrol <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's in the car park, not in the show, though. Well, down in Hall 1, you can tell we're in, in the posh seats because they've got carpet everywhere. You can heart my feet clonking like tap shoes around the hall. But here is a twist on the classic coffee machine, a uh, coffee wagon, if you will. It's a lot of Neva. And this is yet another car I have an insane hankering for because... Yeah, they are objectively terrible, but at the same time, they're absolutely fantastic. If you have that much coffee in the back of one, even better. Now, it's always worth walking to the far end of Hall 1, because around the perimeter of this, you get some really rather premium clubs, if you will. I mean, nothing wrong with the Rover Clubs, who I absolutely adore, because those are my people. But then you don't get to see some really rather tasty 911s and Vipers and things, unless you wander down here. And I'm a sucker for a nice colour car. This uh, early 911 in whatever shade of yellow this is, is very much a by street. As is this rather pretty 356. In fact, any of these, I'd be quite happy to, to drive home. And if they were only on the Porsche Club is wanting to do a swap because they fancy a bit of classic motoring 90s style, then give me a shout. And this is interesting. So 996 produced 1998 to 2005. Let's get, let's you see right inside how it all works, even how the airbags come out. This must have been a motor show thing, I guess. That is a pretty unique opportunity to, to see inside a, a 911. Right, run away and let's see what else we've got. 924 people. Oh, Carrera GT 924, wow. It's always the cool stuff appears out of nowhere. You wonder where it's been and you come up here and suddenly it's all just waiting for you. BMW Club, um, <laughs> we've turned up here before the, the club staff because it's currently not 10 past eight. Um, they may have a slight inflation issue. <laughs> uh, dropping onto their 2002, what is it, 1600s, uh, 2002. 1600s and 2002s look very similar without the, the bumpers and things. E30 race car, that's really quite fun. Let's dip underneath here. Ah, now, this is curious. A BMW 319-45. Not, I've got to say, a model I'm familiar with. What year is it from? 1935. But already we've got the, the BMW kidney grill. Well, that's quite a big nostril on there, so maybe BMW really are going back to their roots with the massive, you know, bonnet to bumper height grill. And now we've got a bit of 5 Series history. Now, this is really the, the epitome of the ultimate driving machine era. So we've got the E28, and it's an M as well. Wow. That's a very, very sweet machine. E34, when things kind of got a bit smoother, a bit more modern, with this 1990. And this is probably the ultimate BMW, one of the greatest cars. Honestly, I'll say this in all seriousness, possibly one of the best cars ever built, the E39. It's a 525i Sport. They are just brilliant. They are, they're, they're a heavy car. They do feel like a heavy car. No getting away from that, but they are so dynamically good. They're perfectly balanced. Unfortunately, it's an automatic. They do everything so well. So I'm, I sound like I'm whispering now, but I've basically lost my voice after talking for three days. Let's pop over to the Mercedes-Benz Group Club, sorry. Actually, one of the, the few clubs I'm actually a member of. This is fabulous. So what are we looking at here? It is a, well, I knew it's not 129, but it's an SL320. It's got custom three-piece forged 18-inch wheels, LED rear lights, with basto roof, handmade body kit, rose jointed rear axle, custom top mounts, custom made leather seats, 
self-taught to paint and repainted 75% of the car at home. Wow. And I'm assuming it's on air suspension as well, sitting this low in here, because that would be, well, if it was on static suspension, those arches would not be in such good condition. That is really, really nice. I love this about the Mercedes Club. They've got a real mixture of the old, the new, the modified, real open to all kinds of things. Last time, I think it was the resto show, they had a superb, I forget what saloon it was, like a 70s, 80s, no, 70s saloon on air. Now this is very pretty. Yeah. Again, okay, so it's a lot. Perfect two car garage if you want to live in the, the roadster convertible lifestyle. If you don't want to go quick in a convertible, so 61, 121, 190SL, absolutely beautiful. Oh man, that's nice. And a 600 Grossa, the dictator's favorite. You had to go into the dealership wearing your large peaky cap and shoulder epaulets before they'd even let you look at the brochure. Your dictatorship had to be above a minimum size in order to place an order. This is a 1970 car. And just look at that dashboard. <laughs> Hendrix <laughs> bottle of possibly champagne in the uh, drinks holder in the door, in the centre console, sorry. And of course it was 60 years of this, there was a fantastic meetup at Brooklands, which I stupidly missed a couple of weeks ago. Oh, and a CLK 63. This is a black edition, I think. It is a black series. These things are monsters. So I'm wandering around here for far too long, really. Oh, left-hand drive, British Columbia. Okay, Canadian import. Check out the different lights. That's quite curious. The different lighting regs in, uh, in Canada. 1981 W126. And they did some amazing colorways back in the 80s on, on these big, dignified cars. And these days, you struggle to get more than a black and a silver. But I've seen these in greens and blues and all kinds of colors. And this is like a pinky orange. I don't know if this camera's got working in the light in here. But yeah, fantastic. Uh, Maguire's always put some good cars in the stands, but as their polish isn't quite as good as the uh, Diamond Bright stuff we've got on our stand, we'll, uh, we'll gloss over that. Now, we also get into some of the more, I think quirky's the wrong word. But well, I'm sitting here looking at a rail type dragster and saying quirky is not the right word. Allard, uh, gentleman's hot rods, and this literally is a gentleman's hot rod. So we've got four cylinder supercharged with a Shorrock supercharger on it, sitting right back in the back. About 2,000 built, 700 remain. And Allard dragsters, just three in the world. So you're looking at something very special indeed. Oh, Chelsea Walsh. Speed history, yeah, support. Grassroots motorsport and historic motorsport. Take us up there for a day. Check out what's going on there. You will not be disappointed. Also, retro riders up there. Worth a look. Okay. They're getting even posher now. Bugatti, and ironically, I was gonna say the people with the most expensive cars are the most down to earth, but then a lot of the uh, more mainstream manufactured owners are incredibly down to earth and lovely people as well. But the people on the Bugatti stand, who are not here right now because it's ridiculously early, are so, so lovely and welcoming and entertaining to the chatting to people about these fabulous machines. They are sort of not unique exactly, but certainly rare, unusual race technology and insanely eccentric uh, company owner. And check out this one, the double rear wheels for grip on the racetrack. Check out the size of those springs. It's your half length leaf springs, that's clever. A little leather just in there to stop the wind blowing up behind the window. Man, this is beautiful. If you're interested in Bugattis, by the way, then check out my previous video, walking around the Schlumpf collection uh, on the Swiss-French border. A couple of brothers collected basically a building full of Bugattis and what were then old racing cars, now vintage racing cars. And yeah, you need to go and have a look at that one day if you're ever driving through Europe, which I would also recommend doing. Jags. So my voice is getting quieter and quieter as I'm running out of the ability to speak. So I'm hoping you can still hear me. So I'll just walk through here going, Jags, oh, racing Jag. That looks exciting. I have the red leather matching racing seats. 
Number six, Coombs, former car, 1973, pre-production two-door. Wow, OK. Is that a double six? Very, very nice. XJ12C. I do, do like these a lot. Austin Healy's. Cool. And there are some very nice, uh, what are these? Rolls-Royce and Bentley. Uh, but I'm going to go and look at that fantastic shooting braking session. But first of all, this is the Atwell Wilson Motor Museum, who I don't actually know of at all. Uh, but yeah, proper Malays era wowness. It's a Mercury from, I'm going to guess, about 1974. Hang on. 1978, okay, Lincoln. So Mercury Monarch Lincoln gear. So I've just discovered that this was started by a farmer a while ago who amassed 80 cars on his farm as a collection, then unfortunately passed away, and, but then the collection got taken on by volunteers and keeps on growing. And looks like they've got some really cool stuff of the Malays era madness. Look at the green vinyl roof. When did you not ever, no, I was going to say last, when did you ever see a green vinyl roof? They've also rather commendably got a Sinclair C5, which I suspect works better than mine. And um, I'm not sort of trying to nobble the thing here, but you know, if I say everyone come and visit the uh, Atwell Wilson Museum, it might not influence this at all, will it? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you much indeed. Thanks. See you later. Man, let's get back to this thing. This is one of my favourite styles of Rolls-Royce, the old shooting brake. This is literally where the name comes from, because the shooting parties on the big house, housing estates, the, the big, big stately home house estates, um, on a shooting party, would go off in these things, with the, the guns in the back and the guns in the seats, because the people shooting the guns are called the guns as well. And then the beaters and things would also go off in these similar kind of things and uh, the servants would bring the food and the drink up in tractors. Um, absolutely stunning things, astonishingly valuable now because the car is based on is astonishingly valuable, but then they, uh, they're so rare. Oh, hello. So I've just seen this little thing here. A James Young body Rolls Royce with parallel action doors. I'm not gonna pretend to know what it is. I think it's something to do with Action Man. Oh, it's got a little Appleton spotlight. It's secretly a police car. That roll back Landau roof, that is. Oh my word, what a beautiful thing. It's amazing how high the floor is in relation to the seats. So in a luxury car, you're sitting with your feet right outstretched like in a sports car. But also, if you can see the position of the gear shift, there's a manual gear shift on this thing. So you're doing the gears with your right hand and you've got to step through between the gears and the seats. I've driven one of these and it's actually not at all difficult to drive. You get used to it very quickly indeed. Just imagine you driving a hire car on holiday, really. But it's getting in and out is astonishingly tricky for something which is so, so elegant. I suspect this one being not much newer might also have its gears in the same place. Uh, I can't, no, this has got a column shift. That's probably why they went to the column shift. Oh, uh, Jaguar Drivers Club, they have made my day. These things were incredible. Le Mans, back in the early 90s, late 80s, these things were just spectacular. They looked so good. The only good thing to come from smoking is the advertising in motorsport. The death and horrible smells are an unfortunate byproduct. And of course, we've got an XJ220. Oh no, this is the prototype because we've got the uh, big scissor doors. I've sat in this car. You see how the gauges actually uh, carry on. When I was working with Mr. Hubnut on Jaguar magazine a few years ago, got to sit in this thing. Kind of got trapped in it because I shut the doors to uh, let me take photos of the interior. I couldn't get out again because it takes two, two people to lift the door. Uh, Aston Martin. What prototype of a DB5 V8? Gosh. I keep on saying it, but. If you've not been to the show, you need to come to the show. You'll keep on finding things you didn't know existed, didn't know survived. People have got amazing stuff in their garages and their barns and their lockups, and it all comes out to be shared and enjoyed. Oh, look at this thing as well. What a fabulous era for, uh, for racing cars. So we've got the Morgan guys behind us. Uh, it's interesting how well, this general style hasn't really evolved, but the, the look of the car is just very subtly different. I can't really put my finger on how it's changed. It's the, the slope of the bonnet, actually, is the, the big difference between a really old one and a really modern one. 
Armstrong Siddling. Oh, yeah. So this is why you've got to come to this, uh, this part of the thing. You, I've only seen an Armstrong Siddling on the road once in the last year. And that's when I was driving up, I think, to the motorist. And I was on the A1. I stopped at a cafe. And do you know what? I think it was actually this car. <laughs> it was actually this kind of ratlock thing. It didn't have the roll hard graphics on the, dash, on the bonnet at the time. But it had oh, it's got different wheels as well now. But it did have the headlight things on. The patina. Yeah, this is so cool. I stopped, took a photo with my Rover 75 next to it. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Railton, crikey. I didn't realise there were, again, another club. I didn't realise there were enough cars around for there to be a club. So look at this engine quickly. Ooh, wow. Is that a giant supercharger on the side of that? Yes. It looks like a giant supercharger. <laughs> well, there's two small superchargers with a couple yeah. of oh, drive mechanisms. Okay, so it's two, two superchargers rather than one giant one, because one giant one would be silly. That's, um, that's terrifying, in fact. <laughs> Thank you. From 1935, the S Spickens Hudson Special. Wow. People were clearly insane in the past. Adventurous, but no regard for safety whatsoever, which is probably more fun, actually. So now I ask the question, what is the plural of Alvis? Is it Alvi? I don't know. I think I might have seen a couple of these cars at previous shows. I'm not quite sure, actually. But I love the bonnet ornament, the hood mascot. Hood ornament? Bonnet mascot? I'm not sure the correct combination of words for these things. These things are insanely dangerous, but oh, that is so pretty. All the chrome just oh, under these lights, it just looks spectacular. And just the shape, this is clearly a 1930s one, that Art Deco swoop, curve, incredibleness of this particular example here. What is it? Let me find out what it is, because it's too good to walk away from. 1936, Alvis, three and a half litre. With, well, it's called a three and a half litre, but it's got a 4.387 six cylinder in it. Oh, uh, the 4.3 engine is fitted as a factory supplied upgrade for the first owner. Okay. But the, the length of the bonnet and the curve of the roof line into that little tapering point and the, the matching little taper down here into this little point. This is just, if you watch the, the Art Deco Batman cartoon in the 90s, this is just all that. So, so good. Just popping past Classic and Sports Car magazine, they've treated us to a, a Lamborghini Countach LP400 Periscopio, which is, I think, basically the uh, air vents on the back. But hang on, if you're interested in buying this car, it's currently £1,499,990. It's not quite one and a half million pounds, but, you know, if it appreciates in value another 10 quid, it's one and a half million. Who, who prices it that way? That's just silly. Uh, I am now running back, we've now got 15 minutes to get back to the stand before it opens. This is EV conversion, so this is going to be massively devices, divisive, depending on your opinion on EVs and EV collected. So this is quite interesting, this is an EV converted Testarossa, 600 horsepower, which is more than original I think, isn't it? 0 to 60, under 4.5 seconds, 60 kilowatt hour battery pack, and 150 mile range. So I suspect this is faster than the other one. Interestingly, I don't know if this is an option and you do get this car converted, this is a massive luggage space area addition to this car, so more practicality. Now, this is quite interesting, this is a def Defender. Not to 60 in 3.8 in a Defender. <laughs> I'm actually not sure that's wise. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know whenever I do an EV converted classic on the channel, it does really divide opinion because with a lot of classics, the engine is very much part of the character of it. With certain cars, though, the engine was just purely motivational power and doesn't add anything to the party. So I'm going to go on a limb here and say Citroen DS, perfect candidate because the engine was always underpowered. It was never a great engine. Stick an EV motor in a Citroen DS, you've got a perfect classic. Look at Gattaca. So now we've reached the grand hoot off at the end of the 2023 NEC Classic Motor Show. I hope you've enjoyed this look around. I know I missed a lot of it because there was just so much and I had so little time. But I did meet so many of you great people and I really appreciate everyone who came to say hello. Now, join me again in another video very soon indeed. And join us again next time, maybe the next NEC Motor Show. Thank you and goodbye. Or like and subscribe, you know the drill.